Well, good morning, Stonegate. How are you? Thank you. Glad that you're here this morning. My name is Craig King, one of the worship pastors here. It's so good to be with you this morning, and uh, it's been a great day so far, and so glad to have you here. I'm going to steal a little bit of Eric's thunder. I didn't see him before. I got to walk up on the stage. So uh, today, uh, you're going to hear this later on in the sermon, but uh, I just I thought it was an incredible reminder for us today as we walk into this time um, of, of why we do this. And again, it's, it's the gathering, so we gather together to be encouraged. But I think the, the most important part that we do today is, is to behold Christ, to behold, um, one, who he is, and, and behold what he's done. Uh, and as we begin to sing these songs and these songs begin to unfold, um, that's what we're going to do today corporately. Uh, not just us and, um, and not just you, but us together as we behold uh, who God is and, and, and both what he's done uh, for us. And so... Uh, may you be encouraged this morning as we sing these truths. May you be encouraged this morning hearing those truths sung around you about who Christ is and what he's done. Do me a favor this morning. Stand to your feet and find someone around you you didn't get to say good morning to and uh, shake their hand. And I'm getting, I'm getting the universal sign for scoot in. So in this time, if you've got a seat next to you, uh, would you go ahead and scoot in for us?
never leave us or forsake us. Love the word picture of this song that you and I are been made glorious in Christ Jesus. Up from these ashes, God has risen dead lives. When 
the mountains fall in the tempest roars you are with me. creation falls still my soul will soar on your mercy now church. It's the reason we 
gather as we, we sing. I know that sounds cliche. But may, may this stir in your heart. May this be the reason that you do all this. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Sing it out. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground. Firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ.
came to church or that we sing together. It's because your son, Jesus Christ, placed himself on a cross for our punishment. And not only that, but defeated death and sin and shame and rose again and is a God who is alive today and makes us alive in Him. That's why we have hope. That's why we have peace. That's why we sing. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Awesome. Thanks. So good to be with you guys. Uh, Hey, Midland. Uh, hey, Odessa. Thank you, guys. Yeah, hey, how are you doing? Glad you're with us. Uh, second week of your soft opening, I guess. Um, uh, I guess soft is all relative, right? Um, it's good to be with you. So glad you guys are joining us. Thank you for gathering together. Uh, we want you, whether you're in Odessa or here, to feel like you found a home. You found a, a people that you can... Um, just belong with. Uh, my name is Eric Clark, one of the guys here on staff, and um, we're going to jump into the scriptures. So if you, if you have a copy of the scriptures today, go open them to or swipe to Mark chapter 1. It's the second gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 16 there. Then we're going to jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and then finish in Philippians 2. And I think, Odessa, you guys are finishing up your, um, your offering. We're doing our offering here. And so while we do that, I want to uh, give you guys really four things that regardless of what campus you are in, we, we feel are important for you guys uh, to know about, maybe to take your next step. A theme that we're going to talk a lot about this morning and the first is this, is uh, you heard Patrick talk about last week, if you were here, we have kind of transitioned our database and it's affected a lot of things, including how you interact with us in giving here at Stonegate Fellowship. Again, we don't want to cajole you or feel manipulated if you're a guest with us. We just want you to be here. That's giving for us here is for those who are planted here who believe in what God's doing in and through this place. But um, uh, the way you interact with giving now is a little bit different uh, than our old system. Hopefully it's a little bit easier. But if you have been giving or had recurring gifts, we'd love for you to uh, cancel your old gifts and move over to the new system. You can find all that information online. Uh, ultimately, we, we made this switch to, uh, to get out of the way of information, let information drive ministry. And so hopefully that can help you guys. The second thing we want all of our campuses to know is that uh, August 18th and 19th, we have a uh, marriage, con or marriage workshop called Mr. and Mrs. Now this is going to be a very fun, practical kind of workshop over Friday night, Saturday morning. Friday night is going to be just a, a great get together with a jazz band, a little bit of dancing. Yes, dancing in that foyer here on our campus. We want you to be here. And then uh, some practical teaching that night and then uh, Saturday as well. And regardless of what stage you're in, whether you are married or thinking about getting married or engaged, whatever season, we want you guys to be involved in that. You can sign up online or you can go out to the Start Here location in Odessa or out to the adult kiosk here in Midland. Want you guys to be a part of that. The third thing is tonight in this room, uh, we are holding our elements service. It's our kind of once a month service where we see God's handiwork on display through the lives uh, of the lives that have been transformed through baptism and we take communion together and uh, we, we, we sing uh, at the top of our lungs about the goodness and the grace of God. 6 p.m. here on the Midland campus, would love for you guys to come and just experience that with us. And then the last thing, August 20th is a big day for us. So Dessa, it's your, I guess, grand opening and we're gonna try to make it as grand as possible. But for here on uh, the Midland campus, Stonegate North is opening at 10.30 during this hour. And as you look around, I mean, you can just look around. There's not a lot of seats here. Um, and, and what we've always done, something that has been of value to us here is that we, we want to make room for those who are searching, who are, who are thinking about this whole Jesus thing. And so, man, if, if you are a long, uh, long term or just, hey, you just want to in, embrace that and jump into that 10.30, August 20th, Stonegate North in Building F to make room for folks. And so those are some of the things that we um, wanted to tell you about because there's some next steps that you guys can take. And that's kind of where we're going today. And so um, there's no really easy way to do it, to transition. But what I wanted to do is kind of recap where Patrick was last week. Patrick last week kind of launched us out 
into a new small series that will take us up until Labor Day. Uh, Kind of the premise is how we win, how we thrive, how we succeed as a local church. If if we could look back at the scoreboard, uh, how we're doing, kind of this metaphorical scoreboard, like how do we know as a church and individually that we are that, that we are winning, that we are thriving, that we are succeeding, defined and in context of what Jesus would have us say. And he began with this verse. They're going to throw it up on the screen. Psalm 118.25. And the psalmist says this, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. And this, this idea is, God, grant us the ability to thrive as people and as a congregation. Grant us the ability to advance and to succeed, defined by you. And where where he landed the plane last week was general success for us as a church. It's to not be about church or doing church, but about being church and seeing lives transform from the inside out holistically so that you and I can grow and become all that God designed, called, and gifted each one of us to be. This idea that we are all ministers here. We're not just a group of passive participants surrounded by a great personality. We are the church. The church is not where you come. It's not a building. They're good tools that we leverage, but ultimately we are the church. And so that's where we started last week. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the baton this week. And you're going to throw this up on the screen the screen. So here's our aim today. This is what we're shooting at. Our aim is to understand how we win, thrive, and succeed at spiritual formation. Now we chose the word spiritual formation on purpose. You might be asking yourself if you have any history in church, why aren't you talking about discipleship? Well, discipleship is a part of spiritual formation, but oftentimes there's so much baggage with discipleship that it it, it can go one of two ways. Discipleship is everything or discipleship is just merely growing in what you know about Jesus. Cognitive, being instructed, knowledge. And really these things can become short-sighted and very limiting. And we want to hopefully awaken you and expand your understanding of what spiritual formation is throughout our whole life. Now, you know, as I got to thinking about this, um, thinking about this week and preparing, been preparing for a while now, but this week specifically, I was thinking about your faces, thinking about the people in my home group, thinking about the other staff members that I run with here. And then I looked at my own life and I said, okay, like if I looked back at the scoreboard of my life, how do I know that I'm succeeding, that I'm advancing, that I am winning and being formed into a 39-year-old man who looks like Jesus and who loves like Jesus. And to be honest, I've never wanted to wear the cape. Anytime the Lord has given me an opportunity to stand before you or any um, size group and to teach the word of God, I I don't want to come across as I've got it all under control because I am just a fellow uh, follower just like you who's who's, who's looking to Jesus and wanting to be transformed. And so I got to thinking about my life I was thinking about things like, and am I growing in a deeper awareness of God's love and his good rule over my life? And am I growing to become more and more a self-feeder or have I kind of hit the, the neutral gear in my life and just become okay with all the scripture that I know and have memorized? Or am I learning to become more and more a self-feeder in my life? Am I... Am I learning to sacrifice for others? Am I growing in my competence and my ability to sacrifice for others to where I am not the center of my own existence? And as I got to thinking about all this stuff, I had to be honest. Am I investing, I wrote it this way, am I investing in others? Am I pouring my life into them? Am I inviting them in to see the real Eric so that they can be the real them? Not a version, but the truth is we can cling to Jesus and I can coach them and they can coach me. And am I growing in my love, not just for leaving the Permian Basin, right, but on a vacation, but am I growing in my love of the Permian Basin and to the ends of the earth for the people that don't know Jesus? And am I seeing people? Am I like really seeing people as souls to be loved for and pointed to the gospel? And to be honest, there are a lot of things that I had to go, you know what, I've kind of hit the neutral 
gear in my own life. I know the right things to say and the right scriptures to recall. And, and I think this is hard for us. If we can just be honest, this family, maybe we picture our Starbucks drinking coffee or maybe if you don't like coffee, whatever you like, orange juice. And we're just talking. And I think oftentimes what we, what we think about spiritual formation or growing as a Christian is, is about growing into some future version of yourself that may or may not ever be a reality. Or we think about spiritual formation as this destination that we're all running towards and sooner or later we'll get there. But, but I, wanna, I wanna encourage you, whether you're in Odessa or here in Midland, that spiritual formation is not a destination. It's not a destination. We never arrive at this side of, of Jesus coming back, a state of spiritual formation fully. Spiritual formation is not just a collection of right thoughts and scriptures about Jesus. See, spiritual formation is a lifestyle of reorienting our lives from self to Jesus over and over again, next step after next step after next step by the power of his grace together. I'm going to throw this up on the screen. This is what I hope kind of is seared in your mind because it's biblical. We're going to see this true spiritual formation is more about milestones and next steps than it is about finish lines. Read that again. True spiritual formation, biblically, is more about milestones and next steps than it has ever been about finish lines. It's not some future place that we run towards and we'll get to one day. It's a life. Eugene Peterson, author and pastor, says, spiritual formation is not something you and I master as a matter of fact, spiritual formation is being mastered by Jesus. Being mastered by his love, his power, his rule, his life. Over the course of a long life of just reorienting our lives to become like him, empowered to live like him. And this takes a lifetime of ups and downs, pains and joy, but it's worth it. But why is spiritual formation so hard? Why does it take so long? Well, I think it's because you and I live within a context where we're being discipled, formed, and we're follow we are followers regardless if you put spiritual on it or not. Each one of us is a disciple of something, an apprentice of someone or something. Each one of us follows someone or something that we hold out to be worth our life. It's being formed as a human thing. And there are forces at work that are discipling, forming, and shaping you as a disciple or as an apprentice in the everyday stuff of life. They're going to throw some of these up on the screen, um, both here and in Odessa. I think that the, the teaching or the instruction in the stories of our day is a big uh, formative part of our lives. What is that story, that cause, that person that you rally around, shift your allegiance to and follow after? Is it legitimately Jesus or is it what's popular in our day? I think our habits and disciplines are also things that completely form and shape us. All of us have routines and habits we're a product of those. The relationships that we embrace, the people that are near us and influence us the most, whether it's our family of origin or through the chapters of our lives or it's the people that we run with now, they have formative power in our life. And then our experiences and our environment really shape us, the circumstances in which we live, the cards that we're metaphorically dealt in some ways. Because there's a lot of things when it comes to just our experiences that Ultimately, they're out of our control, good and bad. We are shaped and formed by that. All of us are. All of us are being formed. But here's the good news for, for those of us who open the scriptures and are following Jesus is that God or that are interested in that or curious about that. Jesus wants to invite you and I into this process of being counter formed from those things. Not to reject those things and huddle up but to see those things redeemed as we become changed people who go into these areas redeemed and changed and made new. 
And so if we're going to do that, here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into Mark chapter 1. Hopefully you've found that. I want to see what Jesus would have to say is the goal first of transformation. Then we're going to look at the how. How does transformation happen for us biblically? And then what is our response? Thirdly, so the first, hopefully you made your way to Mark chapter 1. This is this is uh, explaining Jesus coming out of the wilderness of temptation. Verse 16 of Mark chapter 1, as he, and that he is Jesus. As Jesus passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into a sea. And this is really important, for they were fishermen. And so when you think about formation and Jesus changing your life, you may be saying, but I'm not, a, I'm not a minister, I'm a banker. I'm not a minister, I'm, 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 a, I'm a rig foreman. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a minister, Eric, I'm just a doctor. Or, or Eric, I'm, I'm not a minister, I'm a stay-at-home mom who pours into my brood of crazy, you know what I'm saying, of these kids. I, 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 ha, that's just me. But Jesus, through the Spirit, says, and they were just fishermen to remind us that what you see yourself as doesn't determine the rise and fall of your formation. God took 12 men, a motley crew, and changed the world. And so he says, hey, they were fishermen. And he continues on. He continues on verse 17. Really, this verse is really the central kind of definition or the goal of spiritual formation. Jesus says these two words, follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Now, what's interesting here is follow me is not metaphorical. It's not some like, well, poetic idea of following Jesus. This is, this is literally following Jesus, like following after him, learning from him, learning to be like him, literally following him. And the promise here is if you continue on, or not the promise yet, but verse 18, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat, putting out their nets, or putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, and they hired men and follow, uh, eh, sorry, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed Jesus. A couple, couple observations as we kind of read and kind of dissect these verses. So verse 17, follow me. Again, literal. Not kind of poetic or metaphor, me- metaphorical. I mean, the, 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 re- the reality here is that formation happens as a lifestyle of following him. Formation can happen when we put limits on Jesus or put him in the compartments of our lives or just on certain days of the week or other. Now, again, I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm just trying to say that, that, that if we are going to be formed, it is a lifestyle. Um, it's a new way of life. It's a new orientation. It's a new valuing things and prioritizing things. But the promise of Jesus' invitation to follow me kind of goes into this promise that I will make you. The onus ultimately is on God. We respond is invitation. This idea of of I will make you is to undertake a process to bring about a desired end. Jesus is inviting us in to build us one small step after another small step after another small step. But here's the problem. You and I live in a microwave society. And so sometimes we think that spiritual formation can be microwaved. But the reality is there's no silver bullet, no magic pill of spiritual formation You can't click or swipe to spiritual formation. We can't order spiritual formation and get it in two-day prime, right? It's it's not happening. It takes time. But the promise is if we follow him and embrace the process, he will make us fishers of men. Now, if you have any history in church, the idea of fishing for men ultimately and usually is connected to what we call evangelism, or the sharing of our faith with the hope to make a convert. While that's a part of being a fisher of men, it's, I think it's short-sighted. This is a Hebraic idiom, fishers of men. And Jesus, speaking to this culture, he's saying, I will make you into influencers for my name. 
to disciple makers in my name, to those who take responsibility for others and serve them in my name. So the onus or the goal of transformation is to literally follow Jesus, embracing the process, knowing that he is going to make us into those who are influential. We say it like this um, in Next Steps, that a disciple, the one who is in the process of spiritual formation, is someone who loves and follows Jesus, is being transformed by Jesus, and committed to living out the mission of Jesus. See, the goal of transformation is to actually follow him, not just make a decision. So if that's the goal, right, if that's the goal, how do we be transformed. And so flip with me a couple books to the right. So you're in Mark. Go Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If we are going to legitimately follow Jesus and be committed to this process of being formed, right? Not looking towards a finish line, but looking towards milestones to celebrate and next steps to take. How does this transformation happen? 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul's speaking um, to the church in Corinth and he's kind of, he's kind of, he's comparing and contrasting the old way of interacting with God through an intermediary, Moses, through um, Moses going into the tent of meeting and coming out, had have met with God and his face radiating with the glory and the presence of God, but had to veil it. So he's comparing that to Jesus coming to earth and being God in the flesh and being the glory of God. Now, now read with me here, verse 18. We all with unveiled faces, the removing of distractions, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed or metamorphosed into the same image from glory to glory, or one translation says, from one degree of glory to the next. This is from the Lord who is the spirit. So this is the how we look into the mirror, it's using this kind of picture, and we see Jesus, the glory of God, and we are being transformed from one degree of transformation to the next. And this transformation happens not by our sheer self-effort, but by the Holy Spirit. This is about a surrendered life. Now, they're gonna throw this up on the screen. Uh, not yet, sorry. So the first observation here is, I wrote it this way, transformation is not primarily a checklist rooted in self-effort. So transformation is not about self-effort primarily. Matt Papa, who is a worship pastor in North Carolina, says this, Christianity's first call is not behave, but behold. We sung about it. As Craig and the team led us on this campus over here, and Jeremy in Odessa, all of our songs as we sang were for us to lift our eyes from our own circumstances and look to Jesus, to behold his wonder, his beauty, his worth, and his life, and to be so captured by his story that it shapes ours going forward. The second is transformation starts with the spirit of God. If you and I, whether you're in Odessa or here, need our kind of the you that makes you, you transform, the thing that you, um, uh, the thing that you value with, the nerve center of your life, that, that needs to be transformed and, and re reoriented. Self-effort will not win the day. The Holy Spirit must transform us. The third thing is that transformation is a process of surrendering, right? From one degree of glory or one next step after another next step after another next step. I wanna beat this in, that, transfer, that spiritual formation is not about a finish line. It's not some future version of you. It's, it's unattainable. It's about the version of you that you now being transformed over a lifetime. It's about milestones and next steps. So they're gonna throw this up on the screen. Transformation happens slowly by the spirit, one next step after another as we look, love, and honor Jesus in his word, in the gospel, and in people's lives and in our story. So the work, our first work is not behave, but to over and over, day in and day out, do whatever it takes to reorient our gaze from us to Jesus. Whether it's in the gospel, other people's lives, our own story, over and over and over and over and over again. 
So if that's, if we've covered the goal and we've covered the how, right? How do we respond? And for that, I want you to turn a couple books to the right. So you're in 2 Corinthians, go to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. So a couple books to the right in the New Testament. Paul writing back to this church that he dearly loved. And he gives us and them kind of this kind of clarion call of what our response should be. Verse 12 of chapter two in Philippians, Paul says this, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, here it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Work out your salvation. Dr. James Boyce says, if God has worked his salvation into you by his grace, then we are responsible to work out our salvation by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. So really the first observation here for those of us who want to legitimately follow Jesus, enter into the process of formation, gazing upon Jesus and his wonder, you and I legitimately have a personal responsibility for our own spiritual formation. Now, we're not the only one in this. Another observation here is that God, it's a, it's a partnership of God and us. Now, again, we're not working for salvation. We're not trying to earn God's love or earn his approval. That was secured through Jesus. What he's talking about is how we live. If we've been loved incredibly, we live differently. Dallas Willard, who's a great kind of theologian and author and, and thinker about spiritual formation, says that grace is not, uh, is, is, is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. This idea of work out your salvation here in Philippians 2, it comes, we get the word gymnasium from it. He's saying you need to expend sweat. You need to work at this. You need to take responsibility to literally follow Jesus. You can't wait for other people. You've got to make that decision as you look and gaze at the wonder of who Jesus is over and over and over again. Now, spiritual formation, also the second observation of this one is it's a joint effort, right? It says that God is, at, is working in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Uh, one of our incredible staff guys named Josh Gaywood, I love him to death, he's part of my team, in, ad in adult spiritual formations. He, he helped me a lot this week, had a crazy week, full week. Um, he kind of really helped do some research and helped me get around this. Uh, he, 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 he said something, and I'm gonna quote him, that I think fits appropriately here. Thinking about our own effort, our own responsibility in light of being in love incredibly, knowing that we have the spirit within us. He says this, there is hope. What God commands, he enables. We don't work out on our own strength but with the very strength of the Holy Spirit. Our spiritual formation is not a hopeless effort because God is not a hopeless God. Through his empowering presence, we can and we will experience his life and joy within us. Friends, whether you are a banker or a doctor, a drilling foreman or a pipeline technician or a stay-at-home mom or a professor at Midland College or UTPB or an athlete at high school or, or in college, God wants to transform you. Those thoughts of, I'm too far gone, I'm too broken, you didn't know what I did, I don't have enough time. All those are legitimate thoughts, but they can't become anchors from action. They have to become what form how we approach formation. There's an answer, one step after another step. So you may be saying right now like, okay, Eric, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of agreeing with you. I, I want to take that next step. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be formed. I want to know more about him. I want to take my next step and to become all I'm designed, called, and gifted to be. But give me some practical, practical steps. Now, a lot of times in churches, and I think a lot of us, especially in the South and the Bible Belt, have been at churches where something like this teaching has been communicated and then they leave you with, just read your Bible more, pray more, tell more people about Jesus, and don't miss church. It just feels like a heavy burden. 
that we can't move. Now, those things are a part of formation, but they are narrow-sided. They are just narrow and short-sided. Um, I want to give you an illustration. So I have a fearless three-and-a-half-year-old fireball going on 35 son named Aiden. Some of you know this little guy. He's fearless. And so um, as I think about uh, trying to teach him how to ride a bike, uh, he, 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 he goes a million miles an hour wherever he goes. So if all I ever do is sit down and break open a picture book of somebody riding a bike, how's my son, is he going to learn riding a bike if we just study it, know all the right information? Or if we put video on of, of, of X Games guys or um, Tour de France riders, if, if we watch enough film of that, will he become a, a great rider of the bike? Or what if... What if, you know, he talks to a lot of kids older than him about the joys of riding a bike and the freedom that there is with riding the bike? Or, or, or what if he just imagines, just, will, he become, will he be able to ride the bike by imagining what cruising through our neighborhood would be like? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. See, the way my son is going to learn how to ride a bike is if he just jumps into and on that seat and, and, and he doesn't do it alone, maybe even around some other friends that are doing the same thing, that he's got a coach and his daddy who can come around and go, hey, buddy, remember, this is what you do here. And, and, then, when, and then celebrating with him these milestones and these next steps where, where he doesn't feel like he can, you know, he's just gonna crash and just road rash himself. But I'm like, bud, you just need to you, be, be courageous. Daddy's right here. I'm coaching you. I'm celebrating you. I'm helping you work on your weaknesses. If he jumps in and on that seat with a coach, learning from other people, not thinking about what it will be like to, but trying to ride the bike, that's when my son will learn how to ride a bike. See, the same thing is true for us. We will never ride the bike or learn to ride the bike of spiritual formation if you and I just dream about it and think about it or feel... Be, I don't know, feel um, constrained by the thoughts of I, I'm too far gone or I can never do that or I'm just a, an accountant or I'm just, you know, uh, a high school coach or a rig hand or a banker or whatever. God is calling you in. He's beckoning you in. We have to jump on the seat and we've got to start pedaling in community with coaches over the long haul. You, you follow me on that? We, again, this is not about earning salvation. This is us in response to such a great salvation, learning to ride the bike. So here's what I wanna do. I, I wanna give you some really, some tangible ideas about maybe some next steps for you. That you're sitting in this room and you're going, okay, but what like legitimately do I do? Well, um, I think there are four areas that work kind of synergistically together. They're going to throw this up on the screen here. Uh, just jump in, jump on the bike. The idea is um, instructional, um, where we learn and grow. Um, we're instructed, our habits and our disciplines, our relationships and our experiences. When these four things work together, see, most churches just go, we're going to do another class, another program, another event. But this is short-sighted if all we ever stay is here. We might jump into here, but we ultimately need disciplines and experiences to work together. So I'm going to just kind of walk through in our last kind of six minutes, seven minutes together through each one of these and maybe give you some practical steps. So when you think about instruction, maybe you just need to read a book. Maybe that's saturated in Jesus like gospel or um, gospel fluency that I talked about a couple weeks ago. Maybe you need to read a book that challenges you, or maybe you need to just take a next step by jumping into a class. We have groups and class signups in a couple weeks at both of our campuses. Maybe you need to just start reading, a, reading a, through a Bible plan with a group of people on the YouVersion or Bible app. You guys can wrestle with the text together, not alone. I mean, if I just sent my son out into um, Polo Parkway, we live in the Polo Park area, if I just sent him out Polo Parkway on his own, on his bike, I mean, that's not gonna be good for him, right? But maybe... And the same thing for us when we jump into the Bible. Maybe we just need to find some people to read with. Maybe we need to take a chance to just be a coach. 
I'm gonna do this kind of graciously, but maybe forcefully. Maybe some of you, some of you are sitting in this room, you've been in church your whole life, and maybe you just need to get your hiney off the bench and into the fray and become a coach for a young believer. Again, this is not about earning your salvation, but it's about taking your next step, embracing the next milestone. So those are some of the things about instruction. Now, when we talk about habits and disciplines, man, in our culture, maybe we just need to minimize distractions and embrace spiritual disciplines like fasting and, and solitude and silence. In our, you know, bing, bing, you know, notification, distraction-laden kind of environment, maybe we just need to downshift. Maybe we get a, Maybe we embrace a new morning and evening routine. I mean, even secular psychology is catching up to the truths presented in the scriptures to say, hey, um, maybe you just need a discipline in the morning or at late where you just focus on gratitude, rehearsing over and over what you need to be grateful for. Maybe, maybe you just need to consider some accountability in your life. Not goofy like calling on each other's sins, but like brotherhood, sisterhood, like we're walking together and encouraging and admonishing and outdoing each other in honor, as Paul would say in Romans 12. So when we look about relationships, you know, relationships are so powerful. So I'm not saying that you need to get new friends, but what I, do, what I am saying is you need to consider the influences that the crew that you run with have on you. I mean, how are they affecting you? How do you need to respond to that? Maybe you need to jump in a home group. I mean, honestly, over the course of the two services, I've seen members of our home group walking through the foyer, sitting in these seats, and we've been doing home group now for seven years, and we're in a sweet place with this group, and I just love these people. I want the best for them, and I hope they want the best for me as we link arms every Wednesday night and some other nights and some other days or whatever when we get together in our houses for dinner, and, and then I just, are you missing out on what community could have for you? Maybe you just need to invite some people over for dinner and talk about the goodness of God, or just meet your neighbors learn to bless them. And then lastly, in our experiences, maybe we just need to jump back into or jump into an area of service to leverage your design call and giftedness in our kids ministry, student ministry, or on our campus when we gather, whether you're in Odessa or here, or even into the, the, the city and coaching Little League games and um, going and teaching dance or teaching an art class. I don't know what it is, but what is God calling you? Maybe you can just share your faith and find somebody who, who does it well and helps, can help you overcome that or approach someone to be your, be your coach or become a coach for someone. Again, these are just some things that I've thought through this week as I was wrestling with us, thinking about what could be these next steps because again, following Jesus, becoming like him and becoming fishers of men, it is a lifelong process it's not about a finish line, but about milestones and about next steps. I think about us as one church in two locations, in Odessa and here. And what if we weren't just paralyzed by the fear of not becoming some future version of ourselves, but embraced jumping on the bike, helping each other learn how to ride in, the bike of spiritual formation where we're encouraging and learning together as we pedal. Becoming who God already says we are in Jesus. Living out as a gathered group of people by the empowering work of Jesus as we take responsibility to expend sweat and we love God and we love our city. Yes, 18 years has been good to Stonegate Fellowship. But let's, hope. Let's, not, let's not just be content with the past, but let us yearn and press into the future together being formed. And by God's grace, may it be. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the beauty, the, the, the weight, and the goodness of your word. God, would you take the truths that we talked about here, and God, would you drive them deep into good soil, the soil of our hearts. And God, help us take a next step, whether it's a big one that we've maybe been putting off for a long time 
or it's just another small step of obedience. God, give us the faith to trust you and to ride the bike. Jesus, we love you. And it's in your mighty name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, have a wonderful week. If you need prayer at any of our campuses, there'll be leaders down front.